We are in a series called Remain. Remain. Everybody say remain. And last week, we talked about being grounded and having a source. So today, I'm going to ask you, every one of these, uh, every one of these messages has, is, is, the title is a question. Who's your source? Who's your source? Where's your fruit? Today's title is, Where's Your Fruit? Okay? And no one doesn't say that on the screen. There it is. Where's your fruit? Where's your fruit? Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20. When you have it, say amen. If you don't have it, you can look on the screen. It says this. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their what? By their actions. And so when you read the Bible, bearing fruit is, is a phrase used to describe the outward actions that result from an inward condition of a person's heart. If your heart is not right with God, it will come out in your actions. Come on. And as Christians, we want to bear fruit that are in keeping with our relationship with God. If you have a relationship with God, it will be reflected in your actions. If you have no relationship with God, it will be reflected in your actions. You could say you love God and still go out and party, but your actions are saying you have no relationship with God. Can I get down and dirty with you? I've had people that got baptized one time. They got baptized and went out and got stoned that night to party about their baptism. That showed me they had no real relationship with God. And we, you know, we, we seek to do things outwardly that demonstrate that we have been made new in Christ, like doing the baptism. But, but so the question is, what is the key? What is the key to bearing godly fruit? What is it that you can do to bear godly fruit. See, and, and, and the question, I, as I was st studying this, I asked the Lord, I said, do, do people see my fruit? Can, my, can the, 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 the members of Equip Church, when they look at me, do they see my fruit? And the question I have for you today is, when your co-workers, when your family members, when the people that you hang around, when they look at you, do they see your fruit? Do people see God-sized changes in you? When you say, I, I love God with all my heart, but do they see God the, the changes that only come from God in your life? When they look at you, they're not like, well, I, I, I'm going to wait to see the changes. No, it's evident that they see the changes. Now understand this. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down. Number one, spiritual fruit comes from the Holy Spirit. Spiritual fruit comes from the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 22, says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. Notice he doesn't say works. He says fruit. He said, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he says this, there is no law against these things. When, you know, what, when, 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 when he says that there is no law against these things, you know what he was referring to? You go through all of the laws, the Mosaic laws, and there is nowhere in the Mosaic laws that refute any of those works, those fruit. They don't tell you, don't not, not love or love this way or, or don't, you know, all of them, if anything, they tell you about the works of the flesh. Okay? Your fruit is not a product of your own character.
Your own character reveals who you really are. And I, there's a saying that says character is not who you are when you're in public, although there's a lot of people who are quite character. Um, I like to tell people, if you're, if you're, you're not, you know, there's no fruit loops in the church. If you're fruity, you're fruity by yourself. Um, character is not who you are when you're in, with, around everybody. Your character is who you are when you're alone. See, your, your nature, you say, well, you know, this is just who I am. No, it's not who you are. Your fruit is, is, is not, a, your fruit, your spiritual fruit is not a product of your own character, your own character. Because you have a fallen nature. You're subject to make mistakes. You're subject to not want to love. You're subject to not want to have self-control. You're subject to not be gentle or not be kind or not be, uh, you know, have patience. And that's why you, you need the Holy Spirit to give you a new nature. When you come to Christ, you don't come to Christ and say, say the prayer and then put on the old nature. That's the equivalent of wearing the same clothes every day for an entire year without ever washing them. But yet, a lot of us, we do that. We come to church wearing the same nature <coughs> that we did when we, when we prayed the prayer of faith. Because we never really put on the new nature. We've never really put on the character of Jesus Christ. And the kind of fruit that can only come through the Holy Spirit is the fruit that is exemplified love, joy, peace, patience. It, this is the character of this is the character and the nature of Jesus in us. And in Ephesians he tells us, he says, throw off your old nature. In other words, throw it off. The other day, uh, Saturday, uh, I had to do some work in my backyard. And here I am at 7 o'clock in the morning in my backyard, pouring sweat. And I didn't have to, I had to run, I had to leave there, jump in my car and come to the men's thing. And I felt gross. I was like, man, and I got home. As soon as I got home, I told my wife, she goes, how was men's? It was good. I'm going to go shower. <laughs> Because I felt gross. When the first thing I did, I get to my room. What is, it, what is it you do? I threw off the old clothes. Took them off. Threw them in the hamper. I don't want those things anymore. And he says, throw off your old nature and your, watch this, former way of life. I know this isn't, in the, this isn't on the screen, okay? I'm just kind of teaching from my spirit if that's okay. Throw off your old nature and your former way of life. Do you remember what your former way of life is? Do you remember what life was like before you got saved? When you come to Christ, you throw it off. You take it off and you throw it off because you don't want any part of that anymore. And he says it's because it's been corrupted by lust and deception. And then he said, watch this. Let instead put the, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. In other words, let it bring out, let it cultivate the atmosphere for fruit in your life. And as long as you put on the new nature, he says put on the new nature to be created like God. In other words, you want God to do a work in your life? Then let him do the work he needs to do, which means he's going to, cultivate some things. He's going to remove some things out of your life. He's going to remove people out of your life that are holding you back from producing the fruit that, that looks like Christ in you. And, and he, sometimes he's going to move you out of state or move you for, to a new job or move you to a new church or move you to a new house or move you out or just move you all together just so that he can bring out the nature of Christ in you. So how do you get spiritual fruit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says this. So I say then, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Are you letting the Holy Spirit guide your life? Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Pastor, I just couldn't help myself. I just 
fell into sin. We, we make falling into sin sound like we're walking one day in an open manhole. We just fall right in. Oop, I fell into sin. The Bible says each of us are tempted and drawn away and enticed by our own lusts. So when I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your life, how do you get spiritual fruit? By letting the Holy Spirit guide your life. That little inward voice that says, uh-uh-uh, don't say that. You got to be pulling it back, pulling it back. I was going to say, whoo, oh, no, I got to I gotta pull that word. I was just about to say something. I'm going to pull it back, pull it back. I want to think about that. You're going to remember that today. You know, Pat, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not going to say that. Start, how, how do you get spiritual fruit? You start with surrendering your old nature, your old life. If you're going to bury your old life, bury your old life. Put it in the ground. Do whatever you got to do to remember that you are no longer that person. Come on, somebody. That's not who you are. This is who I am. No, that's not who you are. You got to understand, Pastor. You know, I've always smoked joints. You, you always smoke joints? You, like you came out of your mom's womb with a joint in your hand? I mean, Pastor, you got to understand, I've always been a cholo. Oh, I didn't know you came out with a bandana and little teardrops on your face when you came out of your mom's womb. Throwing gang signs. That's not who you are. That's who you've become. And you can become those things by who you hang around. You want to be a strong believer, get into church. Get around other people who are pursuing God. Get around other people who encourage you to love God. Surrender your old nature. Surrender. You know what surrender? Surrender. I give up, right? I give up. Throw up the white flag. Most of us, we're still fighting God. We're still resisting God. We're still resisting the Holy Spirit when he convicts us, when he tells us, don't do that. Don't say that. Give this. Do this. Go here. Listen to this. And it's not before long that the Holy Spirit will eventually stop talking because you stop acting on what he's telling you. Surrendering to the work of the Holy Spirit is important in your life if you want to bear fruit that is worthy of repentance. When you surrender to the Holy Spirit, He's going to show you what, what is wrong. I see, I grew up in church where everything was can't, can't, quit, quit, stop, stop, don't, don't. Can't go here, you can't go here. I can't go to the movies. Why? Because they show demonic movies there, and, and the whole, those demonic spirits are still there. So you can't go there. Uh, women can't wear pants because, because that, that's... You know, women, that's man's clothing. Women can't wear makeup because, I mean, we, because that's of the devil and only hookers wear makeup. And, and I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, man, these are all these can't, can't, quit, quit, stop, stop, don't, don't. Where's the freedom? Where is the freedom in all of this? The Bible, you know, and, and we get so used to building a, relation, a religion of rules that are, that we, we're, we're like, I can't, I can't do this. Why? I can't because I, I might get kicked out of my church. I, God might not love me. When in actuality, when you build a relationship with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that when you have a relationship and you surrender the Holy Spirit, He writes the laws on your heart and shows you the right things to do. Now, if you do wrong, it's because you're resisting the Holy Spirit from telling you what, you know, you need to go and apologize to your wife. You need to go and apologize to your husband. You need to <coughs> preaching too hard. <clears throat> Amen. You need to, you need to, you know, don't, don't you spend that. That's, that, that comes to my house. You, you know, oh, oh, sorry, God, you know, okay, okay, I'm, I'm going to do that. And there, there's many people are, are not surrendered. There's a lot of people who come to church that are, are that, that have the a religious mentality, and they're not totally and absolutely surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And those, uh, those who are not fully surrendered are compromised. 
When you're completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit, He will bear fruit out of you. You won't even have to try to love someone. It'll just happen. You don't have to, you won't have to be like, you know, oh, I, 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 I can't because I have, I have to have self-control. That's, that's a religious mentality. But you say, God, I surrender to you. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit brings conviction. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be walking like that. You shouldn't be saying that. Hey, change the way you dress. That doesn't look right. And you cannot bear fruit worthy. Uh, you cannot bear worthy fruit unless you are surrendered. How do, you, how do you nurture your fruit? How do you nurture your fruit? Really simple, watch. You keep in step with the Holy Spirit. When He moves, you move. You maintain that relationship with Him. You have to keep in step with Him. Listen to what He's saying. The Holy Spirit is telling you something. He's telling you when to move and how to move and what to do. He's telling you how to build your business. He's telling you how to build your, your company. He's telling you how to, how to re restore a relationship. There was a, young, there was a man that used to come to church here years ago. Years ago. He got offended with me. And I, I didn't think anything of it because I have the habit of inadvertently offending people no matter what. But the Holy Spirit told me, this person is offended. You need to go to him, and you need to wash his feet. And so I called him. I said, are you home? He said, yeah. I said, are you going anywhere? No, I'm staying here. I'll be right there. And he real quiet on the other end. And then I said, I'll, I'll be right there. And I hung up the phone. I knocked on his door, towel over my hand, and bucket in the other hand with water. And I walked in. I said, can I come in? He says, I guess. I walk in, and that's when the authority of the Holy Spirit took over. I said, I want you to sit right there. That apparently I have offended you. And the Bible says that if I know that there's a brother that has an offense, that I'm supposed to leave my gift at the altar and go reconcile with him. And so I want to ask you to forgive me, and I'm going to take on the place of a servant and wash your feet. Will you forgive me? And had I not listened to the Holy Spirit that brother would probably still be offended and probably say, I'm never going back to church. I had a bad experience with church. I had a bad experience with pastors. You, you, have to, you never know who the Holy Spirit will lead you to to minister to somebody. You nurture the word. Of, you nurture that fruit in your life. You nurture and cultivate the atmosphere. You need to get into the moisture of the Holy Spirit, the atmosphere. There's moisture in the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. The more in the presence of God you are, the greater your fruit becomes. And you water it. You water it. Don't just, don't just get into it. Don't be so, so one-sided and be like, it's all about the, the presence, the presence, the presence, the presence. Oh, the presence. We've got to do the presence. We've got to do the presence, the presence. Well, nurture it with the Word. I love the fact. I love when the Holy Spirit takes over the service. I love the, the times when, when I've not gotten a chance to preach because I wasn't certain about that message anyways. But not every service is about just worship, 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 worship. And, and if God lets you, lets you preach. No, no, no. God has a word for his people. And you nurture it with the word. So you get into the presence of God, nurture the Holy Spirit, and then you water it with the water of the word. You constantly open that Bible, read it, nurture your soul, and then allow yourself to be pruned in the heat of prayer. When you pray, don't pray, God, show that person they're wrong. No, pray, God, show me where I'm wrong. God, show me what character needs to be brought out in me. God, show me. What, what attitude I have that's wrong right now because me and my wife are like this. And she's more like this, but <laughs> we're at each other, Lord God. Show me where I'm wrong, Lord God. Change my attitude. 
See, and what God does, we, we, we go into prayer and we want to we wanna pray that God changes someone else, but first God has to change you. God prunes you. He, he, takes, he takes those things in your life. God, if there are people in my life that, you, that are not, not helping me to be fruitful, then, Lord, I give you permission to remove them from my life. Come on. If there are people in, uh, if there are things that I'm doing, God, that are not healthy for me, then God, I give, then tell me, show me. If I'm not supposed to drink coffee, then let my Keurig burn up. Be careful. <laughs> you might get what you asked for, right? You like it? Should I have that donut, God? <laughs> Allow yourself to be pruned. Allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you areas of your life that need to be surrendered. Now, number two. Healthy fruit requires the right soil. Healthy fruit requires the right soil. In the book of Matthew, there's a parable that Jesus tells about the different soil And he talks about the seed that falls on the pathway, the seed that falls on the rocky soil, the seed that falls among the thorns, and then the seed that falls (coughs) on good soil. And I want to read it for you in the Amplified Bible, and it reads like this. The first one is the pathway soil. Watch this. While anyone, he says, anyone is hearing the word of of the kingdom and does not grasp it, and does, uh, uh, does not grasp and comprehend it, then the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. That was, the so- that was what was sown along the roadside. And understand there are some of you in here today that you came into church today because your family members made you come. You came because your wife made you come or your husband made you come. You really don't want to be here. You want to be home watching the game or whatever. And so you sit here and you listen to the preaching and you're like, this is boring. This guy's telling telling me a bunch of things about soil and atmosphere and Holy Spirit. My friend, let me tell you something. I know it's, I know it's pretty funny, but it is, let me tell you something. You're, you're, you are what is called the pathway soil person. And so no matter how much I preach to you until the Holy Spirit does something in your life, breaks up the fallow ground, as in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, breaks up that fallow ground in your life and begins to turn your life. And sometimes it takes circumstances, it takes situations to turn your heart over so that you can re- be ready to receive seed. Because until that time, you, your, your, your family member can make you come to church all you want to. And you'll come to keep them happy because you don't, a happy wife, happy life. But if your heart isn't ready to receive the seed, it's not going to. So stop tapping your wife and telling her, see, I told you. See? See what he said? Because you know what? That's confirmation. You're hearing it. <laughs> Anyways, number two. The rocky soil. I love what it says here. Matthew 13, verse 20 says this. As for what was sown on thin, rocky soil. Thin, rocky soil. This is the Amplified Bible. This is he who hears the word and at once welcomes and accepts it with joy. And yet has no real root in him, but is, but is temporary, inconsistent, lasts but a little while. And when afflicted or affliction or trouble or persecution comes on account of the word, at once he is caused to stumble. He is repelled and begins to distrust and desert him whom he ought to trust and obey, and he falls away. And this is about 80% of the believers in the church. A lot of people who come to church and 
Oh, I can't wait to get my word. I can't wait to get my word. But when persecution comes, when trials come, situations come, the first thing we do is draw away from God rather than drawing into him. The rocky soil. The word begins to die out in you and the seed begins to die. You're not able to bear any fruit because the seed begins to die out because of the fact that you're, you're, you're you know, shallow hell. Your surface level. And these are the kind of people that, that you need to say, well, Pastor, how do I become, stop being a, a, a surface level Christian? Listen, you tell God, you get to the altar today and you break up, you take a hold of the horns of the altar and you say, God, I'm not leaving this altar until you break up the, the, gr- the ground in my life. Until you break up the the shallow rockiness in my life. Remove whatever things are causing that seed to be choked out so that I can be all that I can be for you. The thorny soil, he says this in Matthew 13, 22. I'm running out of time. He says this, As for what was sown among thorns, this is he who hears the word. Now watch this. But the cares of the world and the pleasure and delight and glamour and deceitfulness of riches choke and suffocate the word and it yields no fruit. And this is someone who hears God's word. And I like to call these the, the creasters and every, uh, every other month week, weekenders. Come periodically. I got to work. And I understand work. I do get work. I've, I've been a bivocational pastor. I've had to come on Sundays and then go to work after uh, right after church. I understand that. I'm not putting that down. What I am putting it, put it, what I am putting down is when we chase the dollar more than we chase God. Two things he says here, the cares of the world. The cares of the world are the things that you got to have things bigger than the Joneses. The pleasures and delights, glamour and deceitfulness of riches. You got and and, and is, he's not just talking about pursuing, you know, fame and fortune. He's talking about pursuing the, the, the almighty dollar. I like to call it the spirit of mammon. And you know what happens when you begin to put those things as a priority in your life? It begins to choke the word out of your life. You, you, you stop picking up the Bible and you start chasing after that more than you do what the, the, your relationship with God. And it's not wrong. It's not wrong to make money. I want you to understand that. It's not wrong to make money. I want you to say that with me. It's not wrong. It's not wrong to make money. It's not wrong to go to work. It's wrong when your money and your possessions have you, though. When you are no longer working to enjoy life, you are working, you are living to work. And I said, God, am I allowing areas of my life to to choke out the seed of the word? Not just money, but possessions. You get a 60 inch. Now you want an 80 inch. You want a, you got a, you got a, you know, 2,500 square foot home. But now you want a 3,500 square foot home. You know, you got one Tesla. Now you want two, or you want, you got a, whatever, Maserati or something. In the, uh, none of us have that here. <laughs> We'd want to have that. <laughs> we don't have that here. But and so you, you, you're chasing after material things more than you're chasing after the things of God. But then he says this, the good soil. I love the, the I, I love this. I, I want to just do an extensive study on the good soil because I think that's just amazing. But Matthew thirteen twenty three, he says this: As for what what was sown on good soil, this is he who hears the word and grasps it and comprehends it, and he he indeed bears fruit. What does he do? He bears fruit and yields in one case a hundred times. How many times? A hundred times as much as was sown. In another time, 60 times as much, and another 30. You see, the seed, is, is, it, 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 the seed cannot grow unless you nurture the ground. And your heart, the Bible says, is the ground. It's, it's the place where that seed is planted. And if you're not breaking up the fallow ground, Hosea 12, 10, 12, break up the fallow ground for now is the time of righteousness, now is the time of repentance. 
break up that fallow ground. Say, God, break up the hardness, the neglected hardness of my heart, the area that will not allow seed. Lord, show me where there are areas of my life that are taking over that, that choking out the word of God or choking out my relationship with you. Or, or Lord, reveal to me, show me where in, in, in my relationship with you that, that, that my shallowness, my, uh, there's no depth in my relationship with you. And, 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 and so I can't go deeper and enjoy my relationship with you and the seed is not coming out and I'm not bearing fruit. Show me those things, God. And my question to you as equipped church, as your pastor, is are you, are you seeking God for those things? Are you asking God, show me where I'm at. Show me what things need to change in my life so that I change. Because if by this time next year you haven't changed, you've just wasted a year of your life. I don't want to serve God and look the same as I did last year. I don't want 10 years from now to go by and I, I look worse than when I first came to Christ. I want, in, 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 if you pursue God with all your heart, in, even in five years, I'm not, there, you can't really put a time limit on spiritual maturity and growth, but even in five years, you, you would be farther along and doing great things for God if all you did was say, God nurtured the ground of my heart. Make my heart ready to receive your seed. Take that seed and plant it deep, God. Let it take root. And, you know, part of root, growing roots is staying planted somewhere. Right? Sometimes people bounce around from church to church looking for revelation, chasing revelation instead of chasing a relationship. You can't nurture good ground in your heart and you can't receive seed and you can't grow spiritually mature if you're bouncing around. What happens to a plant if you take it from pot to pot to pot to pot? Every week you're putting it in a new pot. Eventually it dries out the root and it dies. <coughs> so even that in itself, stay planted somewhere. Now, number three, last thing is this, I promise. Is there counterfeit, is there such a thing as counterfeit fruit? Yes. We can become experts at, 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 routine, at the routine of acting like Christians. We get good at coming to church and acting the part. We know how to dress for church. We know how to talk at church. Here we come to church. Hallelujah, praise God, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hey, we're going to have barbecue. Amen. We're going to have carne asada. Hallelujah. I heard a guy one time saying, giving his testimony, hey, when I was out in the world, praise the Lord, I used to smoke dope. Hallelujah. And then I used to get high all the time. Glory to God. I'm like, those are not. <laughs> He's giving glory to God for him getting high. We get so used to that. And it's so easy to become, to put on the, 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 the facade of Christianity while experiencing no real power or bearing us any kind of spiritual fruit. There's a lot of people who come to church, and, and, and if that's you and you're offended, good. Um, because I want you to be awake. As we go through the motions of serving God, we remain so self-centered and angry and, and, and joyless in our walk with God. I mean, we, I got to serve God. It's like that commercial, got to make the donuts, got to make, got to get up every single morning. I got to go to church. I got to go to church. I don't, I don't got to do nothing. I get to, I get to serve God. I get to go to church. I get to work in the house of God. I get to live for God. And you see the Pharisees of Jesus' day, they were, they were all about judging, judging themselves and others by how, they were judging uh, themselves by how they see others. And sometimes we even do that at church. We look at somebody else and go, well, I'm not as bad as that person. And while our lives may be full of church stuff, it's easy also to get full of church stuff. You, you, you come to church, you get busy in church, you're full of church stuff. And yet the question is, are you abiding, are you remaining in Christ? Because if we love, desire, 
and, and, and pursue and fear the things of God, then the, the rest of the world doesn't matter to you. You won't chase after those things. So the key, the key to healthy fruit, the key to healthy fruit is to remain. Remain. What do you mean remain, Pastor? John chapter 15, our, our opening verse from last week, he says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's, not, if it's severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you what? Remain in me. Look at verse 5. Yes, I am the vine. Right? You are the branches. Those who remain in me, as he said it like five or six times in this, those who remain in me and I remain in them will produce much fruit. Remain. In other words, remain in me means to continue in a daily personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You pick up the Word of God because you say, I'm just waiting for God to give me a Word. Well, pick up the Bible. It's right there. Well, I want an extracurricular Word. Look, everything, I'm not that I'm, I, don't, I, I love prophetic words. I speak prophetically. Stop chasing the prophetic because when you chase the prophetic, you become pathetic. Okay? The prophetic will come to you when it's time. You have the revelation of the Word of God right here. You pick up the Word of God. You read it every single day. You have a relationship with Him. You talk to Jesus. Talking with Him is so nice. Nowhere in all of creation, none of the other religions, do they have an encounter and access to the Creator of the universe. But we do. You can talk to God. And he answers you. It's established it's character, your, your relationship with God is characterized by trust. You can't have a relationship if you don't trust God. Right? I love God. You love God? Yeah, do you trust Him? Well, I'm working on that. Well, then you don't have a relationship with God. It's prayer. It's obedience and joy. It's, it's, it's knowing the things of God. He said, remain in He says, remain in me. Have that ongoing, continual relationship with me. When you're married... If you, you know, you think about this. If you're married, your spouse is not going to dig it if you are, 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 are out seeking other relationships. Because in, we see the picture and the idea and the concept of remain when a husband and wife make a commitment to be together for life until death do us part. They're committing and saying, I will remain, I will abide, I will dwell I will build a relationship with you as long as we both shall live. And he says, remain in me and I will remain in you. In other words, he says, he's safeguarding your relationship. He says, I'm going to safeguard your relationship with me so that I continue to abide fully in you. God doesn't want to abide around you. He wants to abide in you. He wants to remain in you. Nowhere, nothing, Buddha doesn't, doesn't offer to dwell in the hearts of his believers. Muhammad doesn't offer to dwell in the hearts of his believers. And neither of them gave their life for their believers like, like Jesus did. Jesus gave his life so that we could know the presence of God. And that presence dwells and remains inside of us. And the pruning is going to come. The pruning comes through trials. We'll talk about more about that next week, but the key in the process of pruning is to remain. When trials come, remain. When finances are short, remain. When the doctor's report is not what you expected, when everyone's talking about you behind your back, when it seems like the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. Remain. If the gas prices go up to $20 a gallon, we remain. And sometimes we can allow our hearts to become weary 
from the desire of worldly things. You say, man, I just want. And, and that's the thing is when you want something, you will exhaust yourself to get it. And then you won't be happy with it. You're never satisfied with getting it. And those things can also, they can, they can drain you and they can push you away from God. When you make that your only pursuit. I found that. I was, uh, the other day I was going through my TikTok. <laughs> um, and I started looking down at, all, at my watch history. I wanted to see what things I, was, I had been looking at. And I could tell early on there was a time when my life, when we were struggling financially. And I was like, because video after video after video is how to start an online business and how to start on, you know, make $5,000, make $10,000 in one month on an online business. And, and, and all of it was a lie because I tried it. <laughs> I followed their steps exactly the way they said, and it never worked. And I thought to myself, it was because I was pursuing the wrong thing. See, God, God wants to give you I love this because one of the, there's nothing that can make fruit prosper in your life. When, when, when you are pursuing other things, when you are chasing after other, other means and it drains the life out of your fruit, nothing like a fresh rain can refresh you to say, I want to go, I'm ready to go again. And in the, in, in the day and time that we're in, let me tell you something. We, we, I've been looking around, and I'm just looking at you. Please don't be insulted by this, but just looking at you, I can tell you're weary in your spirit. There's many of you that came in here, you're, you love God, but you're like, man, I don't got no more fight. I'm exhausted. Pastor, the economy, the enemy's attacks, my spiritual struggles, I ain't got no more fight left, Pastor. Something that happens, I love it, when a fresh rain comes. I thought it was going to rain yesterday, and I could see, like, it was windy and blustery, and there was kind of dark skies, and I'm like, not in Phoenix. It goes, that's their, that's their 20% chance of precipitation. You know, they have a 20% chance of precipitation. You walk out, and it goes, you know, that's it. You're like, no rain. <clears throat> that's, yesterday, I stepped outside on my porch. <coughs> And as, looked at, as I stopped to look at those clouds, I said, is rain coming? Pull out my phone, I'm looking to see, is rain coming? No rain. And the Holy Spirit showed me, there's a dome over our city. This dome, in, 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 in scientific terms, the dome is just basically, it's a heat dome. And it's so hot because of all of the concrete, all of the exhaust, of the, of the vehicles, it's creating a dome and it keeps the precipitation from coming in and penetrating unless a full-on wind blows that stuff out and then blows in a storm. I said, God, we need a fresh rain. We need a fresh rain in our church. We need, a, our people need a fresh rain. And something about it, I'm like, the rain comes and when the rain comes and just like, I love when it rains to where, I mean, thunder and lightning and the car alarms are going off and, you know, the gutter, you can hear the water falling on the, you know, hear the water hitting the pavement. You're just like, this is a good rain. It was all said and done. You walk outside and you see your trees. We have a tree outside of our house and, and these uh, plants up front and they're all green. A couple of days later, they're all green. They're just like, ooh, my wife has an aloe vera plant up front and whenever it rains, you can snap that thing off and it, it just literally oozes, and you're like, ooh, that's good rain right there. Listen, God wants to give you a fresh rain. He wants to pour out his spirit on us so that we can produce fruit. Fruit that when he looks at Equip Church, he's going to go, now that's a church I love. My people love me there. My people, it's not about show. It's not about act. It's not about smoke machines and lights and strobes. It's, it's, it's about 
my presence to my atmosphere. I want you to close your eyes. I sense so many weary souls in this place this morning. There's so many weary people. Don't you sit back there and say, you know, um, that's supposed to be somebody else. It's sense that so strong. God wants to bring a fresh rain. And what we need is a move of the Holy Spirit to shift us to the next level. Everything, every time that the Holy Spirit has moved in our church, He's taken us to another level. And God is doing something at Equip Church. Not because of me, not because of Pastor Tony. Because you are hungry for God. But there comes a time when that fresh rain needs to, needs to nurture and saturate the ground so that fruit can begin supercharged and start growing. You say, Pastor, I'm drained. I'm weary. My soul is weary. My spirit is weary. My mind is exhausted. I don't know if I got any more fight left. I want God to move in my life so that I can have fruit. And when God looks at me, God can say, there's some good fruit there. This message has impacted you, and you say, Pastor, I need that fresh rain. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Say, I need that fresh rain, Pastor. I need a touch of the Holy Spirit.